and uh, as you are all aware, Professor Rockstro is uh, widely recognized as a specialist uh, now in HIV, but also in the HCV field. So it's up to you for, uh, I think, 45 minutes. All right, thank you a lot, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, and what I want to do in the next 45 minutes is really take you through the issues around managing hepatitis C, and as you can imagine, in the era of all the new compounds, this is an extremely exciting field. So the first important question, which we always have to remember, what is the goal of hepatitis C therapy, as that is obviously very different than for HIV and hepatitis B? namely achieving cure. And how do we define cure? Well, cure is a sustained biologic response which implies an undetectable hepatitis C RNA 12 or 24 weeks after stopping hepatitis C therapy. And most importantly, this implies that once you have cure, even after extended follow-up in the majority of patients, over 99%, there will be no relapse. So that is a very different goal and also, I think, has some implications for treatment strategies. And if we treat patients, I think the next most important point, particularly in the setting of increased costs coming with these new therapies, is to sort of think of why do we want to achieve cure? What impact does curing of hepatitis C have for a given individual who's chronically infected? And there's emerging data from different courts, and this is, I think, an interesting one because it is very large with over 200,000 negative veterans from the U.S. and um, 200,000 who have hepatitis C, and they looked at the overall mortality, and you can see that patients who have hepatitis C are having a much higher all-cause mortality, and if you go into the predictors of mortality, it really is uh, striking to see that this is mostly driven by decompensated liver disease. So having chronic hepatitis C leads to clinical rele event, relevant events, which sort of are reflected in this uh, predictor decompensate liver disease, and the only factor which decreases that risk is hepatitis C treatment. So that already gives you a hint of the benefits of curing hepatitis C infection. There have been recent publications, particularly from a colleague from uh, the Rotterdam group, Adrian van der Meer, who looked in a large court of, co of hepatitis C infected individuals, what is the outcome of achieving sustained biologic response, and you can see a dramatic difference in liver-related mortality or liver transplantation, as well as in the occurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma. So you treat for preventing liver events, but also for preventing the emergence of cancer. And then I think the other interesting point is that SVR also reduces all-cause mortality. And I think we're beginning to understand, just like in HIV, that in the setting of a chronic viral infection, the interaction with the immune system may cause inflammation, and having inflammation in the context of a viral infection, even irrespective of whether you have fibrosis or not, may cause inflammation-related events. It could be renal events, cerebrovascular events, or cardiovascular events. And so it's interesting to see that in a more recent publication of this year, successful antiviral treatment of hepatitis C was also associated with improved renal and cardiovascular outcomes in diabetic patients. There are now also reports of patients who are diabetic once they achieve SVR that actually their consumption of insulin and uh, the necessity of uh, diabetes treatment has changed. So really showing that there are other outcomes which also change favorably after achieving SVR. Now, the history of hepatitis C therapy is something I think you're all very well aware of. We started off decades ago with non-modified interferon thrice weekly in different time intervals, 24, 48, 78 weeks, which all only led to very suboptimal response rates in the range of around 10 to 15 percent. And then with the introduction of pegylated interferon, particularly then in combination with ribavirin, where the mechanism of action still remains to be discussed controversially, you can see that you achieve cure rates in genotype 1 patients, something between 33 and 46 percent, and then in patients who have genotype 2, 3, much higher response rates on around uh, the average of around 80 percent. Nevertheless, obviously, there was room for improvement. 
improving particularly cure rates in patients with genotype 1 or 4 who were more difficult to treat, and then clearly a decrease in the uh, associated adverse events coming with interferon and ribavirin. And if you think of your own patient courts, majority of patients were never treated because of the perceived notion of increased toxicity and contraindications for applying these therapies. Clearly, there was the wish for shortening hepatitis C treatment duration. Think of patients with adherence issues where that would be important. And then looking for treatment strategies for previous non-responders under dual therapy and then treatment strategies for those perceived patient groups who were more difficult to treat. And remember, there were many patient groups which traditionally were considered to be very difficult to treat. That included the HIV, hepatitis C co-infected patient population, where particularly in American cohorts, response rates were on average not higher than 15% for genotype 1. Think of African American patients were also most likely due to the unfavorable distribution of the IL-28B genotype, which is enriched for CT and TT, which comes with a lower response to interferon therapy uh, in that particular patient population. Think of the issues around treatment of patients with steatosis, potentially also impacting the response rates in genotype 3 patients, and then the much more difficult to treat patient population of cirrhotics and those after liver transplantation. So clearly, the advent of new direct acting antivirals were the entree into changing the entire world of hepatitis C therapy. And I think we all learned a lot from HIV, looking at a schematic replication cycle, looking at the different steps of replication, and where potentially targets could be developed which pharmacologically could be addressed with corresponding development of DAAs. And so there really are three group of drugs we're currently investigating, NS3 protease inhibitors, which prevent the processing of hepatitis C proteins, which are required for replication, the inhibition of NS5A, a multifunctional protein, which plays an important role in viral replication, and NS5B inhibitors, which inhibit the RNA polymerase and thereby prevent replication of the viral genome. Now, the big difference between hepatitis C and HIV and HBV is that it is not integrated into the cell nucleus, it's only in the cytosol, and actually targeting viral replication steps is somewhat easier than when the virus can hide in latently infected cells. And during some of the sessions here at this conference, you will listen and learn about cure strategies, and will remember that that is sort of one of the open questions, how can we reach latently infected cells? So in hepatitis C, it's a more straightforward uh, sort of scenario. And so Jean-Michel Pavlotsky, who I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, has come up with this diagram where he basically says, well, cure of hepatitis C actually is sort of simple because hepatitis C is a different virus than HIV and HPV. And really what you need is a potent combination of drugs. And if that potent combination of drugs drives down replication below the limit of quantification, and if that comes with a high barrier to resistance so that in the time before you're reaching low limit of quantification, you have no selection pressure and resistance emergence, then you will eventually cure. So it's really just the selection of the most potent agents, which drives down replication potentially as fast as possible in combination with a high barrier to resistance, which would then imply cure for all. Now, obviously, these drugs come at a certain cost, so there are also issues like who has an indication for hepatitis C therapy? And I think that's something we're struggling with. And Easel, I think, was very upfront by coming up under the leadership of Jean-Michel with recommendations which were presented at the Easel Conference in London just a couple of weeks ago. And so there are overall recommendations that all treatment-naive and experienced patients with compensated disease due to hepatitis C should be considered for therapy, which really implies every single person who has signs of chronic hepatitis C RNA replication, which would be longer than six months. Clearly, there's a prioritization of patients with advanced fibrosis for obvious reasons, but there's also justification for treatment in patients with moderate fibrosis. And I think that's very important because if you remember what we reviewed in the first part of my talk, looking at the change in clinical endpoints, I think we have to ask ourselves. In the absence of fibrosis, do we still have a positive impact on subsequent diseases? And could that then in the end be cost effective because we prevent cardiovascular events, prevent the emergence of diabetes, and so forth? So I think that is important, and you will see data from co-infection 
uh, which has been published earlier from Juan Berenger's group from Madrid, which actually highlights that even in patients with F0, F1, and F2 fibrosis, there is a significant improvement in overall survival. So I think that sort of all goes in that direction. I think we'll see more data emerging when more cohorts will come into place, looking at the benefits of early DAA-based therapy intervention. So for now, they're saying in patients with no or mild disease, which would be F0, F1, the indication for in timing of therapy can individualize, and I think that also reflects, obviously, that if you have no fibrosis, you can wait for better tolerated and, at best, interferon-free therapies in the future in case that is not reimbursed or available in your country at that time point. Now, what are the milestones of DAA-based therapies? Well, in 2011, the first generation PIs, Bisepravir and Tilapavir, were licensed for treatment. So I think for a lot of us, these new drugs came with quite an improvement in many things we wanted. They came with much higher cure rates of around 75% in genotype 1 patients. That was almost twice as high as what we'd seen before, at least in more difficult to treat patients. But because of the high rate of adverse events and the cumbersome application, thrice daily, subsequently, Flapper was also be able to give them twice daily, but it came at a high price of anemia, skin rashes, and so forth. Now, with the advent of newer drugs, actually international guidelines no longer recommend the use of bisepravir and tilapavir. And I think that's a critical point because it tells you how short the half-life of these drugs have become. I think it's important, though, to highlight that these drugs still represent a clear advantage over historic dual therapy. So in countries where these are the first agents to become available, I think we should still consider their use as they may be life-saving in patients with advanced fibrosis. Nevertheless, clearly the advent of new compounds, in particular sofospivir, which was licensed in 2013 in the U.S., early this year in um, Germany and other European countries, was really a great breakthrough because it targets the NS5B nucleotide polymerase. Uh, it, it, uh, it's a nucleotide which targets the NS5B polymerase. It comes with a different resistance profile than the first-generation PIs, so, so far no resistance has been described. It allows cure in around 90% of patients, here shown in the neutrino trial and treatment-naive genotype 1 infected patients in a shortened treatment duration of only 12 weeks, so clearly thereby replacing all other compounds which in combination with pegylate interferon and ribavirin usually are given response guided for 24 weeks. So clearly shortening this to 12 weeks was a great breakthrough. And you can see that these overall very positive results were independent of race. So even in the more problematic black patients responding very well. There was a little bit lower uh, response here in, in the 1B patients, uh, but overall good throughout the different genotypes tested. And you can also see that the response rate was somewhat lower in cirrhotic patients, but still very high with 80%. And then the compound was also investigated in genotype 2-3 patients and led to further New England Journal publications. And you see here the main studies for genotype 2-3 summarized. And clearly for uh, the genotype 2, sofospivir and ribavirin represents the first interferon-free treatment we now have available, which allows cure for most of the patients in an interferon-free setting. You can see that genotype 3 patients are responding less favorably. Uh, and, and clearly the combination of sofospivir, ribavirin and interferon seems to still be a way forward for uh, genotype 3, at least in some patients, whereas for interferon ineligible, and particularly by extending the sofospivir, ribavirin duration to 24 weeks, allows also an interferon-free approach with high cure rates over 85%. But now in 2014, and gears shifting, we see other drugs on the advent of being licensed. Semepivir, after having received approval, is now being licensed, at least in Germany, and is available from tomorrow onwards. So allowing first DAA combinations, Dicladosphere and NS5A inhibitor, uh, has been uh, become available through a compassionate use program, which addresses patients with a more advanced liver disease, a life expectancy of less a year. But uh, there's also a patient name program, so there has been uh, some access to the cladosphere already. The expected uh, overall regulatory approval for Europe is in September this year. So with that, we sort of have three 
uh, cornerstones of future and present hepatitis C therapy, which will be available this year and would also allow the combination of the respective compounds. Uh, with regard to semeprevir, let me highlight that this is a second wave protease inhibitor. There's always this separation between second wave, meaning it's a pharmacologically different protease inhibitor. It's once daily. It comes with a different adverse event profile. But resistance-wise, it's not different. That's why we define it as second wave, whereas other PIs, which also work in the presence of telapavir or bisepravir or semeprevir resistance, would be a true second-generation protease inhibitor. So if you look at the online easel treatment recommendations, you can see that they've taken the attempt to sort of list all possible combinations also based on availability, reflecting that in Europe different countries may have different compounds at different time points. So there really is, on the one hand, the possibility of still having interferon ribavirin as your backbone and then having one of the three mentioned DAA uh, uh, available, so either sofosbuvir or semepivir declatosphere, but I think in all fairness we have to highlight that the sofosbuvir pec riba combination comes at 12 weeks and the other ones at much longer duration, so clearly that seems to be the superior uh, combination if you're using still a pegylated interferon based regimen. And then obviously you have the option of combining sofosbuvir just with ribavirin or sofosbuvir with semeprevir, or sofosbuvir with declatosphere, and I'll try to walk you through some of those uh, recent trials. Let me just highlight uh, the semeprevir data, because obviously with its availability from now on, this is also an alternative. Uh, I think the big differentiation is that in a response-guided therapy approach, which most patients qualify for, you will still treat after 12 weeks of triple therapy with another 12 weeks of PEG and RIBA, so I think it's still a longer treatment duration. And this is the only DAA where there's also um, a difference in response depending on baseline genetic polymorphism. So if you have the QADK substitution and a genotype 1A, then you can see here from the phase three trial that there was a lower probability of cure of only 58%. And so in most guidelines, prior testing for the QADK is recommended in genotype 1A patients. I think the other important point I want to make around uh, the EASL guidelines, because obviously at this conference you're talking mostly about HIV, and, and so how are we going to deal with co-infection? Well, that has become very simple. I think the EASL has taken a great step forward by saying indications for hepatitis C treatment in co-infected individuals are absolutely identical to those with mono-infection and the same treatment regimens can be used. So they're no longer separating. They're saying this traditionally difficult-to-treat patient population has exactly the same superimposable response rates as mono-infected patients. Neutrino, sofosbuvir, pegylated interferon ribavirin, 91% cure rate in genotype 1, exactly the same in co-infected patients and the results of feldaprevir or semeprevir with PEC and RIBA, again, absolutely the same. Telaprevir, bisepravir in the pilot trials with PEC and RIBA, same response rates. In the interferon-free trial, photon, one, exactly the same response rates. So there's no longer need for separating. And that's important because traditionally, HIV patients were not allowed into clinical trials for hepatitis C. And I think what we now have to ask for is to rigorously also include these patients Merck is the first company which has allowed that in their Seaworthy trial. They have an arm with co-infected patients included into the different arms, and I think that's the right way forward. The only caveat is you have to look for drug interactions. Obviously, some of the hepatitis C protease inhibitors are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system, just as many HIV drugs, so there is a higher risk of interactions, and you will know that for telapavir bisepravir, we had restrictions, particularly with PI use and efavirenz use, and the sole same holds true with semeprevir, which also has uh, quite some interaction, so you cannot use it with a boosted protease inhibitor, and you cannot use it, um, and that's wrong here on the, on the, on, on the um, no, sorry, it's, it's right, you can't use it with efavirenz. So efavirenz and boosted PIs do not work with um, semeprevir as well as the travarine. Whereas for sofosbuvir, we have a good combination possibility for everything except boosted tepranavir, and obviously that's a drug we don't really use that much. For declatosphere, you can see that most of the drugs are possible, but there is some dose adaptation, and in the easel guidelines, you will see that for boosted adazanavir, for example, 
a lower dose of 30 milligrams is recommended. So just make sure that you check interactions also beyond HIV drugs. And there's a great uh, Liverpool website, which you are all very familiar with from the HIV side, which now also exists for hepatitis C. Now, obviously, all of us really want to get rid of the interferon, and I think in 2014, these chances are there. So let's review the data of the three possible interferon-free treatment options we have. So for genotype 1, uh, a lot of noise has been made around the COSMOS study. This is a trial which looked at the combination of semeprevir and sofosbuvir plus or minus ribavirin for 12 or 24 weeks, and they looked at different cohorts of patients. And at the recent EASL meeting, they showed the results from core 2. Now, that is a group of patients who has advanced fibrosis, so F3, F4, and also included patients with prior null response. So that's what always turns out to be the most difficult, null response, cirrhosis, and that's where you really want to see how do these drugs perform. And I think it's very reassuring to see that in this sort of enriched patient population for more difficult to treat patients, at least traditionally, you can see that the overall cure rates are on the average around 94%, and that is with or without ribavirin, and extending treatment to 24 weeks doesn't really help. So it looks as if semeprevir, sofosprevir for 12 weeks is just fine without ribavirin to cure the majority of patients from this more difficult to treat patient population. Now one question could be, is there still an impact in the combination of these two DAAs with regard to the QADK polymorphism? So you can see overall there is not too much impact, um, but if you look into the semeprevir sofosbuvir ribavirin arm at the patients who had a genotype 1A with QADK, that was the lowest response group with 88% which still is obviously very high. So there's maybe a hint of a little bit of, uh, of tendency that that might still play a role, but clearly not as much as when you combine it with interferon and ribavirin. Looking at the sofosbuvir and decladosvir combination, and I think this is also interesting because this was studied in treatment-naive patients for 12 or 24 weeks, but it was also studied for 24 weeks in patients who previously failed a telaprevir or bisepravir therapy. So they already had triple therapy, and so the question was how do they perform? And you can see that with or without ribavirin, these patients did exceedingly well, 100% responded in the PI failure group. Um, and although the numbers are small, and we'll have to be used to that, that many of these hepatitis C trials are done with small numbers, I think it is striking to see that there is a great rescue possibility, and obviously that combination holds quite some promise. Looking at genotype 2, I think that's where the solution's already there. We briefly mentioned before the results of sofosbuvir and ribavirin, and they're just repeated here, where you can see that indeed overall cure rates are extremely high, maybe somewhat lower in patients with cirrhosis, and therefore extension to 16 weeks is a possibility uh, in, in, in patients with cirrhosis, because you can see on the very right-hand side in the pretreated patients who already failed one previous cycle of dual therapy, that prolongation of treatment duration to 16 weeks was associated with a higher cure rate of 78%. For genotype 3, the sofosbuvir ribavirin combination would be one solution, or sofosbuvir and decladosvir, which also has genotype 3 activity. And you can see that overall the uh, response rate is much higher if you extend treatment duration for the sofosbuvir ribavirin combination to 24 weeks. So I think one solution here is obviously extending treatment duration, and then at least for the less challenging patients, looks as if you have good response rates, but again, the numbers are very small, so there's some caution in that cirrhotic group uh, where you see 92% cure rates, only 13 patients. Looking at the treatment experience patients with cirrhosis, that's where you see that only 60% respond despite having the 24 weeks of treatment duration. So I think it does tell you that for genotype 3, there is still a need for some improvement. So particularly in the patients who are previous null respond or cirrhotics, I think that's where you really want to consider dual therapy in the sense of DAA combinations. And fortunately, we do have some data from treatment-naive patients looking at sofosbuvir and decladosvir plus minus ribavirin. You see extremely high response rates. I think in the end, though, what we need to see is the same kind of trial in treatment experienced patients, which includes null responders with cirrhosis, to see whether the two DAA combination can overcome 
the challenges we have in the soft riba alone combination in that particular patient group. For genotype 4, unfortunately, we have no data available for the combination of sofosbuvir plus simetprevir or sofosbuvir plus dicladosvir, although theoretically there should be activity, and you may extrapolate that uh, and, and use these compounds, but there's no data to date uh, of these combinations in those uh, patient groups. So how will hepatitis C therapy change? So obviously, 2014, I think, is the year where for the first time you can already promise DA combinations with very high response rates. But what is to come this year and next year? So the next wave of breaking data is emerging. A whole range of New England journals coincided with the EASL conference, and all those phase three trials were also presented there. And it's really two combinations which are particularly far advanced in development. One is the fixed dose combination of lodipasvir and sofosbuvir. So sofosbuvir is co-formulated with an NS5A inhibitor by Gilead, which uh, was shown particularly for genotype 1 patients in different patient populations. And then there's the AbbVie three-drug combination of a protease inhibitor, ABT450, which is boosted by a low dose of ritonavir, and that is co-formulated in one tablet with ombitasvir, which is an NS5A inhibitor, and that is then combined with a BID polymerase inhibitor plus minus ribavirin, and you'll see that data in a minute. So Jean-Michel published a paper this month looking at the future where he basically came up with three options. One sort of would reflect what we have right now, could be a protease inhibitor like semeprevir or an NS5A inhibitor like dicladosvir, which you could give with a nucleotide analog like sofosbuvir, plus or minus potentially a further non-nuke when they become available, plus or minus ribavirin. Second option could be sort of the fixed dose combination of the AbbVie compound, protease inhibitor, NS5A inhibitor, and the non-nuke, plus or minus ribavirin. Then option three is what Merck is developing, which would be a second generation PI, a second generation NS5A inhibitor, plus or minus ribavirin. Now, that would sort of list all of the given uh, drugs. It would be sofosbuvir plus lodipasvir plus minus one of the Gilead uh, polymerase inhibitors, potentially even allowing shorter treatment durations. The AVRI three-drug combination uh, also potentially going for shorter treatment durations and then the two compounds from Merck. And then there are also other DA combinations, which for reasons of time I'm not going to address. So let me walk you through some of those exciting results from those phase three programs. And it's important to remember these drugs are not somewhere in the future. They're very close. So the sofosbuvir lodipasvir fixed dose combination is expected to be licensed in the U.S. by the end of the year and potentially also in first European countries. In their phase three program, which is called ION in the ION1 trial, they looked at the efficacy and safety of sofosbuvir lodipasvir fixed dose plus minus ribavirin for 12 versus 24 weeks in genotype 1 treatment-naive patients, including 15% of patients with cirrhosis. And you can see that on average, almost everyone was cured in this regimen. So you do not need the extension to 24 weeks. You do not need the ribavirin addition. So clearly, it's going to run down to 12 weeks of one tablet per day with sofosbuvir and lodipasvir. Looking at the IN2, which was done in treatment-experienced patients, you can see that overall very similar results were obtained regardless whether it was genotype 1A or 1B, suggesting the potency of this regimen is very strong. And again, 12 weeks seemed to be just as good as 24 weeks. And then I think for me, the most exciting visionary study, which was done independently from pharma, from uh, the NIH, and presented at the CROI meeting, looking at the fixed dose of sofosbuvir lodipasvir with either GS9669 or 9451, and sort of asking the question, if we would have the most potent combination, could we even further shorten treatment duration? And I think that's one of the remaining very interesting questions, because you could say, well, if I work in the setting of Baltimore or other uh, areas where I have a strong clientele of IV drug users with adherence challenges, many people being um, having social issues, no permanent housing and so forth, uh, 
how can I reach this kind of patient population where adherence is really the driving challenge? And so obviously being able to shorten treatment duration even beyond the 12 weeks we currently have would be a value. And so they looked at either the fixed dose soft ledipasvir or six weeks of the three DAA combination. And you can see they all did very, very well, suggesting that actually even shorter treatment durations are feasible. And clearly that is of great uh, excitement and could potentially pave the way into very short treatment durations in the end. And obviously that also raises the question, could that eventually even lead to cheaper regimens, taking account that you need these drugs for shorter durations? And I think that is still open, uh, an open question. Looking at the phase three, three drug AVI combination uh, development program, which is called SAFIRE. You see here the genotype one treatment naive non cirrhotic patients, SAFIRE one, the combination of the fixed dose PI, boosted by ritonavir, in conjunction with the NS5A inhibitor on bitesvir, and the polymerase inhibitor desabavir plus ribavirin for 12 weeks in comparison to a three to one randomization uh, with placebo to have an idea of the safety profile. And you see here again, over 95% responding regardless of genotype 1A or 1B, highlighting the efficacy and potency of that combination. And the same holds true for Sapphire 2, where they looked at this combination in treatment experienced patients. Again, extremely high response rates. And again, this was true whether they had relapse, prior partial response, or prior no response. So even in a more challenging patient population, this worked exceedingly well. Now, the other question, because this was all in conjunction of the three DAs plus ribavirin, so the question is, could we also get rid of the ribavirin in this context? And actually, this is exactly uh, what you can see here, that in the PEARL-3 trial, with or without ribavirin and genotype 1B, so this is only for 1B, you see that ribavirin does not add anything. So there also will be a ribavirin-free option, at least for genotype 1B, with this combination. Looking at the Merck combination, the Seaworthy trial, this is their second generation PI plus the second generation NS5A plus minus ribavirin. Again, also looking at different treatment durations, 12 versus 18 weeks, um, and that includes patients who were treatment naive and had cirrhosis in one part of the study, or patients who had prior null response and cirrhosis. And you see that in all these different patient populations, in the follow-up uh, of week four and eight after stopping therapy, excellent response rates on average 97%. So Jean-Michel always summarizes that and he says, easel, this is what it was all about, 100% for all. I, I think what I try to show you is that that is obviously not true. So no responders with cirrhosis, genotype three. Some of these patients in real life I think are gonna remain challenging. Patients with adherence, will that play a role in 12 week or longer treatment durations? But I think what we really have to sort of appreciate and acknowledge is that the cure for hepatitis C has arrived, it's there. Interferon-free combinations are available, and we will have to think how to best use them in clinical practice. And that, I think, brings us, in the end, to what is this all going to be about. It's going to be about cost, cost and access to therapy. And so it's important to think, what could this eventually mean? If we would presume that the situation remains as is, and that is sort of the baseline situation, you will see the curves of liver-related deaths attributed mostly to hepatitis C-related viral disease is different for different countries because treatment and screening strategies are different. So in France, not because clearly Jean-Michel played a big role in that, so there was a much better screening and treatment program in France overall, and you can see even with the current rate of screening and treatment, you will shape the epidemic and have less liver-related deaths, which in other countries, uh, like in Spain or England, is not really necessarily happening, where different emphasis on screening and treatment is currently in place. But you can see that if you suddenly have regimens in place where everyone is cured, in contrast to dual therapy, where this was a much lower number, and under the presumption that you would increase also um, screening and putting patients on treatment because of the better tolerability and the higher response rates, you can actually shape the epidemic quite favorably, and you can see that with that kind of model, you can bring down the liver-related deaths to very low numbers in all of these respective countries, really highlighting that we have in our hands with these new combinations the chance to shape the epidemic quite favorably, and I think that's something we all have to work on together.
So in summary, I think we've come quite some decades which were driven by interferon-based regimens, and some of us may even miss the interferon to a certain extent. But now, after the introduction of tilaprevir and bisepravir in 2011, clearly there has been an increase in velocity of the development of further compounds. And whereas in HIV we were lucky to see sort of one drug being licensed year by year and follow intellectually how the story developed, here everything is happening at the same time. And we're already having now a whole variety of different interferon combinations and more at the end of this year and early 2015, which will allow us to treat everyone interferon and ribavirin-free uh, with very high probability of cure. Thank you very much.